Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Lucinda Havenhead, the current chair, head of the Interior Architecture Department. And I just want to welcome you all to this event for Joe Lennonstall uh, to celebrate her career with us at EMCG. All her 37 years. I apologize. I'm already losing my voice, so sorry about that. Um, I just want to note that this event is partially funded by, well, actually, it's mostly funded by She Can, We Can which is a two year, um, two year long uh, event that unfortunately UNCG tried to have this a year of the pandemic. It was gonna be the year um, and that didn't work out too well. So it's extended to two years. Um, and when we were getting ready to do this, it's like, I don't know anybody that epitomizes she can, we can more than Joe and stuff. But, so those of you who know her. And so it just seemed the perfect time to honor you at this event, Joe. Um, and so we have our esteemed Patrick Lucas here to speak about Joe's career. When many of you know him. And if you don't know him, he used to teach at UNCG ages ago now. Ages ago. I, mean, I taught here 20 years ago before I came back. So um, we have a recycle. Actually, I replaced, you replaced I me. I did, and that was hard for all of us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and here I am again. Anyway, um, so he's going to tell you all about Joe. But I did want to mention that Joe, that we um, have decided that we're going to have an annual lecture in your honor. We're going to call it the Lyman Stahl Lecture. And uh, we'll, well, in some ways you're kicking it off, okay? To preserve and take forward Joe's legacy, which I have to say is very significant. You all know that HP, <clears throat> excuse me, HP at UNCG is Joe. So, so without further ado, Mr. Patrick goes to flip it. And I'm not gonna read all stuff. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, wow, it's probably as overwhelming for me to stand here um, as I think it will be for Joe after this is all done. So I've tried not to make this too much like a roast because I'm not sure that was the goal in mind. <laughs> but Joe, one of the things that I do want you to do, if you don't mind standing up for just a second, this is not the moment you'll be in the spotlight, but I want you to turn around and look at the audience and see if you notice anything peculiar about what's happening in the clothing world. <laughs> They were strongly encouraged to wear blue. So in, in, in one of your honors of, of the idea that that's one of your signature colors for sure. I, I appreciated the fact that you said there was a range that helped a lot of people. So, but remember when I asked you for the photographs of things from your house, there was a Pantone description that went out to all these folks. So, um, and those folks that are online, hi, because there are about eight or 10, as I understand. Um, I'm hoping that you all can hear okay. And I'm trying to adjust accordingly. Um, for, for that group of the audience that is joining us from all over the world, which is kind of cool that that's the case. But that also speaks a little bit about the kind of imprint that this relatively small person has had in a large, large way from North Carolina and beyond. And that's some of the themes that you'll hear about tonight. So um, Joe and I struggled mightily with the title um, because one of the things that you'll learn is that I, I was able to talk with a quite a number of grad students who have been um, respond or have been under Joe's tutelage along the way. And so we had lots and lots and lots of stories, some of which you'll hear tonight, um, and, and wandered around a little bit on the title and ended up with this one, uh, Women with Impact Making Their Mark. Um, and the real notion of tonight's talk, and I will say it's more talk than a lecture, it's not a polished, finished thing, um, because the work's not finished yet. So this has inspired me to think a little bit more about um, some of the stories that need to be generated about UNCG's program and its strength over time. And I'm not necessarily volunteering for that, but I'm looking for volunteers who might be in the audience who would be interested in that. 
grad students and former grad students, I'm thinking of you. Um, but but the notion is that this this program since 1958 has had a tremendous impact not only on the local community but I would say on the state and certainly the southeast region and some would say where where things are headed in, into sort of a more national perspective. So um, that work gets started um, in work that I have to tell a story about. So. Um, one of the things I said to one of you out in the lobby, I can't remember who it was um, because I hugged a lot of you. Uh, Joe and Jerry are so great about sharing people. And I think about how lot my life has been so different because of the way that they shared people in Greensboro, the people that I met. And I knew I was gonna cry because um, <laughs> it's like a little bit of a homecoming here too. And you all know that I'm um, from Kentucky, got to move back home and that's sort of where my great love is. But my second one is definitely here. And it's largely because Joe came to my office. We had neighboring offices in the Gate, Gatewood building. And one day, about the third year that I was here, still as a new faculty member, very intimidated by people that were full professors. Um, and she said to me, I need a big favor. And she was sort of breathless. And I was like, OK, what's going on? And she said, there's a meeting over at the Weatherspoon. Can you go to it? And I said, well, what, what meeting is it? Tell, give me a little bit more context. And I could tell like she needed to go to do something else and so it was a quick thing she said well they're doing a, an exhibit on Gregory Ivy who was the first department chair um and this wonderful woman Dabney Sanders out in the community she's really interested in having a house tour of these great modern houses that are here would you mind going okay what do I need to do while I'm there she said well I know you had experience because of your nonprofit management in doing house tours so like maybe you'll have some ideas and you can sort of bring notes back and we'll do whatever well I mean that turned into a 10-year ongoing as you all know like this amazing really cool greensboro story that actually crossed back into the interior architecture world so what you're seeing here of course lowenstein and the women of the 1958 commencement house north elm street um great publicity photograph from unc uh the grand opening you know a month from now yeah, this would be happening because the uh, publicity office dubbed these houses the commencement houses because they recognized that women in their final year of the program uh, were kind of having an opportunity to do something a little bit different and that was to work in the community and actually design and build or help build or help furnish at least as we've understood um, a house and and Lowenstein was involved and uh, that story I'm forever grateful for because then not only did that lead to like all of the things that that uh, Lowenstein legacy led to and many thanks to folks like Nancy Dahl at the Art Museum who, who sponsored all of these things um, we uncovered a huge pile of records from the firm. It's like a, a historian's dream. And some of the people sitting in this audience were in the attic with me, helping with that uh, dream. And so Joe threw an innocent question. And I think that I would just tell you all, every once in a while, just say yes, even if you don't wanna do it, you never know where it'll lead to. And it led to some really great places for me. And I, I know that that's been part of what um, my career has been so successful largely because of you, Joe, and that innocent question that you asked in 108 Gatewood Building. Um, here's another early picture that just gives you that there was not just one commencement house, but there are three. You all probably remember that story. Um, one in 59 on Rockford Road and then one out um, in 1965, a little further from town. But what you're seeing here is design education at its earliest uh, effort. And what is interesting is kind of what I found out next is that um, looking at at Lowenstein and his he was a visiting lecturer kind of a one off sort of scenario and kept bringing him back and he had folks from his firm that were working as well uh, in in what was then the Department of Housing and Management and you'll see the dates on that are 1958 to 1975 then a transmorphication happened and it became the Department of Interior Design 75 to 81 didn't last too long under that name right and went back to housing and interior design kind of as a combined thing 81 to 2001 and finally to the Department of Interior Architecture that we know today starting in 2001. What, what probably is interesting about that is that this echoes what's happening pretty much all over the United States in terms of interior design programs. And I wrote the three words, art, home economics, and architecture. Those programs grew out of those three worlds, either an art program, sort of like UNCG, this is what happened here, um, and then had a home economics route as well. But an art program started typically with housing design kinds of things then uh, merged into sort of a more commercial kind of world in terms of the interior design uh, education sphere. The second place was home economics, again, starting with housing design and moving out into the uh, broader ranges of the field. 
And the third were programs of architecture that recognized they didn't quite have all the bases covered and they needed to start an interiors program to supplement what they were doing in the architecture program. So we're a product at UNCG of art and home economics kind of coming together. And here's a litany of projects and, and people through the years that I think describe some of the innovative work that's going on there. Tying into the she can, we can. So thanks for that um, opportunity. And um, all of the people involved in the first 10 years of the program are women, every single one. So you'll see Madeline Street, the first chair, and Mary Miller, the second chair. And some of you in the room remember Mary Miller because we've, we've talked about that some, right? Yep. Um, I think it's really compelling and telling that this department in its infancy was in the hands of strong women. And that's something that I think that's worth celebrating one and two recognizing that that has a different kind of DNA perhaps than other programs in the country because this was a woman's college. Yeah. I know just a couple of names up there from some of the research that I've done, but boy, would it be interesting to know a little bit more about all those people. Again, seeds planted, say yes sometimes, you might want to, you never know where to leave. Um, so a little bit of a timeline there is that in by 78, we see Jan MacArthur's name appear on the list of faculty for the first time as a part-time instructor. And Jan, more of you will in the room may know that Jan, and on the screen, because some of the folks that are watching are, are from those, uh, that decade, she was the department chair that was sort of the third major department chair for um, the program. Um, you see that we're in year 20 at that point. I would also point out here, Sally Shelton, an incredibly strong woman, I had very great fortune to meet, as much as responsible for the glue that held the department together as anyone, um, was also listed on the, on the roster of, of personnel here. So there's a strong woman in a support role that I think is probably, has a pretty important uh, story to, sh to share that's about this department and how, how it evolved. Joe Ramsey, not yet Lyme installed, joins the faculty in 83, year 25 of the program, and you all know the love story that's in the second row down here, right? So Jerry's there, they get married. There's lots of things that happen subsequently. I think she said yes, maybe, right? So there's that idea again. Um, and I would just make uh, maybe three other notes that sort of relate more specifically to the preservation story that you're gonna be hearing a little bit more about. 1990 is the year that the MS degree is launched with a historic preservation concentration. And you have to think, and I did not have time to do this work, but that's really early in the history of the United States of preservation programs. And that's largely thanks to the person that's sitting in the second row down here in her not signature color, I might note. <laughs> I told her she'd stand out and she does. Um, but it was important to note at that point, Joe had been there um, for, for seven years, preservation courses were already being offered. It's just that it sort of became formalized as an MS degree with that concentration. So that's kind of a, a significant year that we want to mark. Conveniently, 10 years later, <laughs> Joe worked with uh, in a public history partnership, largely with Lisa Tolbert uh, and the Department of History faculty to launch uh, a more robust version of the program, including the public history side, um, the sort of museum study side of that program, uh, launched some certificates there and then certified the program. And this is significant with the National Council for Preservation Education so that it became a place that people recognize that preservation education was happening. But I would say, again, looking at that list of programs, you might go back to 1990 or 2000 and see that UNCG is pretty much the only one that's throwing design and preservation together. And that's a theme that you're gonna hear a little bit more about from some of the grad students that I interviewed. Um, and then finally, the beloved field school. And I've already told Sarah and Heather, I'm calling you all out, say yes. Someone needs to do something to document the impact of the field school on this on this program. And quite frankly, the great times that were had all across North Carolina as a result of the field school and the network of people that you encountered as the field school. Because I think that it also makes more single UNCG as an experience because of the field school. And I'm seeing all the graduates go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? I think one of them said uh, during the interviews that I did with them, like, I don't know that I'd be the same person. I, I don't do hands-on work, but I understand how the hands-on work works now and know how to make that happen from maybe pushing more paper, that kind of thing. Okay, so to the person of the hour. With credit to Ian, if he's watching, because that's his photograph, right? Okay, um, uh, Joe, Joe and Jerry's son-in-law. Um, 
Here's some quantifiables if you want to know. 200 plus courses taught in this 37 year career, nine teaching service or research awards, a million dollars in financial support largely to the preservation effort, documented 80 houses with Thomas Day Woodwork and visited a whole lot more. Joe wasn't willing to say how many more. <laughs> and of course, co authored a terrific book. Um, we estimated, and I think this might be low, but we'll go with it 100 plus communities in North Carolina alone impacted by her work. Multiple thousands of miles traveled, largely in North Carolina, but many other places as well. And 21 sets of design guidelines, two with Heather Slain uh, in the, at the end of the list. Um, countless articles, white papers, and reports. Oh, that's just the beginning of the list, folks. 19 years total as the director of graduate study, 27 grad students supervised uh, with thesis completed, 17 additional thesis committees beyond those 27, a faculty advisor to 50 plus certificate students, popular choice, and 50 plus student award winning or recognized presentations where she was the faculty advisor. That's a pretty great track record from the grad program perspective and the joke inside the academy as it would be outside the academy and way too many committee meetings as a result of all that. You know, the chancellor's house moved down the street, largely thanks to Joe. Um, advocacy trips to DC uh, that contrasted, and I found this to be a really interesting idea, is that a lot of the students talked about the field school, but they also talked about things like this that were getting your hands dirty in a different way, I suppose, um, talking with politicians about uh, the importance of preservation and sort of balancing those two worlds. Living in both of those worlds was a pretty important kind of aspect of the program. Um, the New York trips were mentioned a good bit, and particularly Joe worked with an undergraduate studio uh, doing the Made in America House Design Competition at Woodlawn, which got, got some significant awards. So I think all of those are examples of um, kind of advocacy work in many forms, but I would also include things like field trips to towns and cities in the Tar Heel State and beyond. That's part of this kind of advocacy work. Living preservation, right, and being out in the community to do that. So uh, a few of the more printed and real things, uh, property value study that's been a pretty seminal one for the Southeast. Uh, a very interesting outbuilding documentation project in Greensboro Local Historic Districts. I'll let you ask Joe about that at the reception. Um, they, could, they documented the 1958 commencement house before sadly it was torn down. Uh, in this building worked on the Greensboro Historical Museum Historic Structures Report, uh, did some documentation at the Greensboro Masonic Temple, and took the show on the road, and I'll look over in Giselle's way because I know she was there, uh, the Re Renew Orleans Building Documentation Project, which followed Katrina, uh, Joe and Jerry and I, all three, took a, a group of 12 students to New Orleans and did some documentation there that was needed uh, in order to uh, get buildings improved. Partner in the Tryon Palace Symposium, her greatest partnerships with the, with the State Historic Preservation Office and friends at Old Salem uh, yielded this amazing field school that I'm gonna mention a couple of times tonight. Heather and Sarah, are you listening? Okay. Uh, since the mid 1980s, the historic dimension series, there are about 70 plus of these that students have written, Joe has edited, are now, now online and available to preservation professionals on wide ranging topics about materiality kinds of things, but also more conceptual kinds of things. And some of you proud authors are sitting in the audience for sure. Um, and then maybe most significantly, the, uh, in the last few years, the presence of the UNCG Main Street Fellows with around 14,000, 1,400, 14, no, $414,500 in support for that program, which is continuing to make a mark that Joe began. And I might note here, and this is a sort of significant sort of circular moment, Joe was at Main Street when she came as a faculty member. And at the end of her career, got Main Street back again, back into this world of, of UNCG. Now she did lots of Main Street things along the way, but it's really significant that those bookends are there. And a lot of that work is being continued by the capable hands of Travis Hicks. Um, I make three jokey notes down here. If you've ever been on a trip with Joe, the first thing that you will see, whether you're a preservation person or not, is some great example of rising damp, okay? And then she'll point out either good or bad, mortar repointing, we've all been there. And then finally, my own special moment with Joe uh, maybe in my fifth or sixth year that I was here and they were hurrying to try to get a teaching evaluation for Joe. And I was like, okay. Um, I sat through a long lecture about architectural metals and learned a lot of things um, that I still to this day remember. So 
lasting legacies in all kinds of ways. Um, what about quantifiables in the service and community? Like, look at that list of all the things that she's done, right? I'm not going to read through those because I think that you can um, digest that, but recognize that there are local names. She's had significant impact on Guilford County and Greensboro for sure, North Carolina. And then she also has the um, experience as the National Alliance of Preservation Commission Board of Directors and its president. So that reach of her in that context of preservation world is pretty important. And I think that's something to take note of tonight. Here's some not, here's some extracurriculars that she was up to. So there's an architecture practice that we're probably not going to talk about as much about we should. Um, there's Jerry, there's Will and Ramsey, there's the dogs, there's the rehabbed building that we've all probably been fortunate to be in at least once in our lifetime. And if not, I'm sure that you'll get an invitation soon. Um, those great social gatherings, probably some of the best times that I've had in Greensboro. And I the, the students that I interviewed remarked time and time again how critical it was for them to see Joe in her element of making real a preservation dream in a place that was a tough place to start. And Joe and Jerry have lots of stories about like conversations with bankers and realtors and all the dramas that occurred at that south end of South Elm Street. We sat around the kitchen table having a little snack before we came here tonight and they're, they're recounting like all of the restaurants that have opened since I've been gone seven years, right? Rude. I, I mean, I want to try all of them, right? But they're all like within a block of Joe and Jerry. And there's a, there is a, a grocery store coming across the street. So like great news for these urban pioneers who are in, in their, entering their second phase and enjoying the fruits of their labors, I would say, um, for sure. So uh, those countless amazing meals, Joe's a great cook if you didn't know that. And I estimated a thousand, is that right? In the bottle wall, I counted rows today and it might be more than that. That's why the plus is there. So. Um, you may know that Joe does not like to be in the spotlight, right? Um, so I told her she had to prepare a couple of times to stand and, and, and get some applause, and we'll do that at the end for sure. But um, we strategized about what exactly might be the right thing to do for her in honoring her legacy as a teacher and a mentor and advisor. And so how I spent my spring break this year was talking with a baker's dozen, because Joe couldn't get it to 12. We had to have 13. Um, great graduate students. And, and I mean sincerely in the parentheses, it would be easy to pick a second baker's dozen and a third, right? And I think that work remains to be done. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. There's another opportunity for yes. Um, it's interesting to hear their backgrounds, how they got to design school. It's interesting to hear about their stories while they were here, which largely um, we talked about. Um, and I'm just profiling some of their careers just to give you some sense of the impact of this woman in the second row is huge, huge. Um, these will all be placed in record at the Jackson Library. So don't be surprised, though, if you get a phone call from me. And that, by the way, goes for people that are not necessarily alumni of UNCG, because the story of Joe's legacy is really broader in the community. And I just didn't have time to get to that because my spring break was only a week long. So. I think this is telling in itself. One of these grad students went into teaching. One went into a Main Street job. Four started their own businesses, largely attributed to Joe as seeing her as a role model. Two are in government positions. One's developing historic properties. One is in nonprofit work. And three are in private practice. So that spread, not surprisingly, especially for those of you that are preservation minded in the room, you recognize that that's really the range of all the possibilities. And it's significant that we have just this microcosm of the 13 that got picked out for this presentation that represent that range. So she inspires in more areas than one. So without further ado, getting to um, these 13. So um, I, I categorized into four categories. I'll go ahead and let that cat out of the bag. I bet you can think of other ways to do this work. So network is an important word for tonight. That's always important in the preservation world and Joe knows it better how to do it better than anybody I know. Um, the notion of innovation, the idea of encouragement, and finally, the notion of authenticity. So those are the four words, network, innovation, encouragement, authenticity. And see if you see that those themes ring true, but also look for your own themes to see if there's other things here that we might explore together. Should we do this talk in another, oh, at the next line, saw lecture. Okay. 
And I'm at that stage where I have to take off to read these notes. So you all are very blurry right now, but that's fine. So Liz Parm is first up, uh, director of the North Carolina Main Street and Rural Planning Center. She said of Joe that she's a powerful and kind woman with knowledge to share, for sure, with a passion for preservation and community, um, that her chief legacy is connecting students to the preservation network um, and guiding hundreds of students along the way that ended up in great places. And we're gonna hear that theme in the, in the next 12 that come. Two students, Liz noted, Marissa Angie in Valdez and Abby Nelson in Morganton, who we'll hear a little bit more about in the presentation tonight, both have become Main Street directors because of Joe's influence. Um, Liz characterized that Joe's significant legacy stems from her Main Street program, of course, and the design guidelines that she's done for many communities in North Carolina. Um, and I might note this brings us all the way around that loop back to the Main Street partnership with IARC that's going on currently. Um, which is a not notable legacy in itself that I'm sure will have its own history to tell um, before too long. Mardita Murphy uh, it, uh, started her own firm, Rooted Preservation and Design. Uh, she's located currently in Denver, though she's moving around the West some. Um, Joe is a big reason why UNCG was her choice. When she came, she knew that's the person that I wanna work with. Um, she said that Joe had high expectations and standards, but supported and advocated for all students, no matter their background. Um, she, she considers Joe to be a strong force, and, and here's how far the reach goes. She still talks to people in Denver and out in the West who know the name Joe Ramsey Lyman Saul. And Joe told me earlier today, like, students, be careful what you say out there because it'll get back to me. We're in this big a network, and that's absolutely true. But it works the other way as well. So um, Joe is a strong female role model in a male-dominated world. This is a theme that we're going to hear a lot about. Uh, Mardita credits Joe with having inspired her to open her own business. And um, in, in academia, Mardita characterized that typically your success is largely measured by your own accomplishments, what you do on your own. But Joe's impact is deeper, according to Mardita, um, not just boxes, checks, but life's impact. Then she followed up her interview with this beautiful email that I have to read part of uh, for you. I do have a funny story to share about Joe. Joe and several grad students attended the National Trust Conference in Washington, D.C. in 2015. Attendees would gather in the lobby between sessions to chat and grab refreshments. Naturally, all the grad students were convening to share exciting takeaways from the previous lectures. Joe would find us, shake her head and say, you all just clump together. Stop clumping. <laughs> in other words, she was encouraging us to get out of our comfort zone and network with new faces. So the theme of networking. Tori works for the DPS uh, Group Global in Cary and Tori's here today. Hey, Tori. Thank you for thank you for this interview. Uh, she said of Joe that she lives her profession and personal life in an inter interconnected and seamless way, and this authenticity provides great value to Joe's own work and in the models she set for students. Tori used the metaphor of an anchor to sketch in Joe's influence of her own schoolwork, and I just sort of think about that idea that you could always go back to Joe and sort of get reassured. Okay, is this the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? I'm seeing Tori nod a lot, so yeah, that's absolutely true. She recalled particularly Joe's ability to rally a, a community as an interconnected professional within the network for whatever reason. So that notion of the network is, is definitely there. Make sure I'm staying in order, okay. Heather Wagner Slane, who's with us tonight, also started her own business, HMW, uh, that's her initials, by the way, um, Preservation in Durham. Uh, Heather talked about Joe's hand in shaping the community and camaraderie, camaraderie of students in the program when she was here as a student, and then most significantly as professionals after graduation. Um, so Heather has this unique relationship. She was a student for a while, and then Joe started calling her up and saying, hey, can you come teach? And she taught at UNCG for a little while. And then Joe said, hey, how about these design guidelines? How are you feeling about that? So they ended up doing two of them to get together so that Heather could get her, could, 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 could cut her teeth. And that meant they spent a lot of time in the car together. And that meant that that personal time and that sense of having fun intertwined with this very serious work of preservation. Um, she did say that Joe quite, could quite often offer design criticism to the unkind changes made to old buildings in their travels. And she wished she'd kept a tape recorder for some of the <laughs> witty rejoinders. Heather noted in the construction and architecture fields, it's a man's world. And, and yet Joe provided a role model, one that you own up to what you know, that you're confident and you stand up and be the professional that you are, Joe is never afraid to stand up and put her foot down. Uh, Heather, among many, mentioned the field school as a seminal moment in the program, particularly seeing Joe's preservation network in action during those moments. And 
that Joe respects the old ways in terms of craft, but Joe is always learning and trying new things, always inquisitive and curious. And perhaps that's the greatest of her model behaviors, that it's okay to change your ways and think of new ways to do things. And that brings us to the second theme of innovation with Joe Ramsey on install. Okay, Graybeal is up next. She's deputy director of Guilford County Planning and Development. She also came home, which is kind of a sweet story that she can tell you about. Um, Joe uh, K K uh, characterizes great at all aspects of preservation, philosophical, technical, scientific, policy, hands-on design aspects. Kay ended up in the policymaking uh, world and loves the philosophy behind that. And Joe's teaching influenced Kay, according to Kay, into that public sector work. And we need folks who are rational human beings in government for sure. <laughs> Joe is persuasive, persuasive and convincing, said Kay. She's well-read, well-studied, speaks with confidence, and she's a well-respected authority. Joe has demonstrated that preservation has value. She was the first to plant the seeds to create a program specifically to blend design and preservation and was a, such a go-getter that she just made it happen. She's open to new ideas, open to students pursuing new avenues and supports them. Joe does not stop with the formulaic. She's exploratory and exciting and fun. And then Kay wrote later, after the interview, uh, Joe not only sparked my passion for preservation through meaningful roundtable discussion on theory and philosophy, but also through opportunities for hands-on experiences, including the documentation of the Thomas Day House Union Tavern in Milton. I've enjoyed a 22-year career in urban planning and historic preservation, and know that all began because I was fortunate enough to have Joe as my mentor, who took a personal interest in my career path, and I've seen her do that with all students. Next up is Lauren Holstemeyer uh, at Kelly Sutherland McLeod Architecture in Long Beach. Um, we interviewed when it was snowing in Kentucky and she was in the sunshine out in California. Uh, Joe always has a different way of seeing things and the ability to give you a different approach when you are stuck, said Lauren. Uh, she's always open to new ideas. As long as you're willing to try, there's no sense of failure, whether it's in a teaching scenario, in thesis, or she's learned in the rest of her career. So that's something that she's taken to heart. Uh, Lauren learned the valuable lesson of integrating new technology and not leaving marks. She was actually part of that Woodlawn project. And that was a key thing that the uh, award recognized in the Woodlawn project was the notion of being able to come in and gently include things and be able to, to leave and as if you hadn't been there sort of notion, which is really at the center heart of what preservation is about sometimes. Um, Lauren recalled the experience of Joe as a whole person. And here comes this theme for sure where every year Joe and her family hosted dinner to meet and hang outside of the classroom. These dinners were places where you could talk about anything, not just school, and thus dissolve the boundaries between teacher and student. Sarah Lockenman, who's here today, also started her own business, 4 over 1 Design in Durham. Uh, Joe, uh, Sarah said that Joe's interconnections to the network of people in North Carolina and beyond, and as she said it, who did all the things? Like she, Joe knows everybody that did all the things. So that means anything, right? Um, Sarah remarked that her whole program of study came from Joe's passion in it. So this is where the engine that kept the wheels on. And Joe has this uncanny ability to redirect and pull you back and be able to keep those wheels moving so that you finish. And that's an important skill, I think, for any teacher. Um, Joe's greatest ability, according to Sarah, is the ability to guide gently. She helped prepare people to do amazing and different things in preservation. And for Sarah, Joe's legacy is to send her teaching forward into practice. That's so, so important about Joe as a teacher was that a lot of the seminal experiences involve field work. But what that means is that those of you that are in the field are able to do that work because you had the opportunity to practice while you were in school. Sarah recalled a specific time when Joe had created a field opportunity for students and the session was going well. Sarah looked over to Joe. She smiled that Joe smile, you know that smile, right? And Sarah knew that that smiling face indicated that Joe had achieved the goal of the lesson. She brought people together from different worlds and the information was trans transferred. It's the simple things, right? Giselle, who's with us tonight. Oops, there they go. That's all right. Uh, Director of Interior Design Program at Forsyth Tech Community College. We had a very interesting pre-conversation about life in, the, life in the fast lane of teaching. Um, but I would say that Giselle noted that Joe has continued being a mentor. She's a phone call away, right? And a role model long after she graduated UNCG with this Forsyth job. Um, Giselle shares the jo with Joe the joy of watching students to go out and be successful. She recalled particularly the Renew Orleans experience as one example of both, well, lots of things, Joe's mothering instinct, 
her capacity to be a compassionate guide, her ability to be at ease with anyone in any situation, and we had a lot of situations in New Orleans, and her high expectations demanded in a quiet way, really nicely said Giselle. Like others, she noted Joe's presence in, uh, in the male-dominated professions in a long and ongoing career and significantly noted Joe's ability to blend her professional and personal life with great success. Giselle praised Joe's ability to bring together people and to guide people where they wanted to go. She noted that this seemed to be Joe's natural way of being, and thus we enter into the encouraging or the idea of being an encourager um, that is Joe, Joe Ramsey Lyman stall. Abby Gentry Nelson, whom I mentioned before in the Morganton Main Street uh, job, uh, she said Joe always wanted the best work and wanted the best for her students. Though she encouraged students to think independently, she was always there as a guide. Abby felt the shelter of Joe's wing, and I think this is significant, but also the nudge to take wing under her guidance. And Joe always seemed to know the right time to get you out of the nest. Abby shared that Joe's classes were always amazing, recalling Joe's gifts of storytelling and the idea of keeping students engaged, particularly with hands-on activities. And Abby admits, and she's, I hope, watching, um, that she found thesis development highly stressful, and who doesn't? Um, but whenever she went to Joe's office, she always left with clarity and new insights and a power to sort of finish it out. Like others, Abby talked about the many skills she gained at the field school. Um, she noted, I think significantly, when studying with Joe, you see new possibilities always. Abby also enjoyed social times at 629 South Elm, including the special flash mob, and you knew it was going to be mentioned, performed in honor of Joe's 60th birthday that Abby, Abby helped coordinate. Kat French, who's with us tonight. Uh, Catherine French Designs, very formal name, by the way, LLC um, in Chapel Hill. Kat complimented Joe's ability to stay organized while ju juggling a million and one things and the many things and the many things that she, Joe did to keep Kat from juggling all those things too. So she noted that in one-on-one -on -one time with Joe, that she benefited from Joe's full attention and that's significant. Somebody said in a meeting at UN, uh, UK the other day, um, if love is paying attention, Joe Ramsey, Joe Ramsey Limestall knows what love is. And I've been in that special circle of light. And it's wonderful to be there and wonderful to have that guidance. Um, Kat remarked about Joe breaking barriers as a woman working in design, construction, and preservation, where it was and is very rare to see a woman in charge in the room. So she said that Joe broke glass ceilings for women to have access and paved the way for students. And it was important for her to make sure that that was also in like architectural preservation practice, but also things like writing about Thomas Day, which was a totally different um, ceiling that was kind of shattered. Uh, Kat noted that Joe was very detail oriented um, with the expectation of consistent outputs. So Joe, if Kat is redlining, she admits, I often find myself pulling a Joe, and which means eagle eye, everything's spelled right, and things line up. Look, she's nodding in the back of the room. <laughs> um, Kat said in closing the interview, I hope that one day I'll have the leader, leadership legacy that's the same as hers, with high standards, with kindness, with support when needed to create new avenues for others. In short, Joe, you crushed it. <laughs> Monica Davis, like recent grad, like getting ready to do it, right? So 2022, she's actually in the Tulane grad program right now, um, but significantly is involved in hands-on work. Uh, largely, she attributes to, to her, um, working with Joe in Wilson, North Carolina. She called you her rock, um, that you're knowledgeable, that you value hands-on work in the field, and that you walk the walk and talk the talk in community engagement with impact on individuals and communities. Uh, Monica uh, pursues this work with real-world application, understanding history of a district of African-American houses in Wilson, and importantly, is actually working on renovating them, right? So um, that's a significant thing. Um, she wanted to be sure that I recognized the women power of the Ocracoke Field School, and she said you wouldn't know what that meant. I don't know what that means for the rest of the room, and I'm not sure I still know what it means. Um, Monica recalls a time not too long ago when the blue Mini Cooper pulled up in Wilson, and Joe pops out to surprise Monica to check on her, to see how things were going, and to say that that was so meaningful for her unexpectedly, and I think it was a surprise that you all encountered each other as I understand it, right? But that that really spoke to her, your values as a teacher. Um, in her words, the mama bear, always looking out for students. Claire Keene, 
who has a job at Henrik Sigmund Butler based in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, said of Joe that she was and is encouraging. She's one of those that also takes advantage of post-graduation mentorship. There's always a place for everyone with Joe. She's a gentle leader and a guide. She listens to you. She sits with you. She is always energized and always present. We had a lot of fun together, and I think it's important to recognize the fun theme that's working through here, even though it was serious work. She spoke of the field school and lobbying in DC, two very different but very essential applications in the preservation field. It was a relief, she said, always to be in Joe's calming presence, knowing that that was going to make her finish and get through it. She said of you, Joe, that you live an authentic life. And the realization of that is Joe and Jerry's home taken in a historic building as urban pioneers, something I spoke to earlier. In this special place, and it truly is, Joe and Jerry have shown great ability to adapt the historic building in modern ways. They have bolstered it and they have given it a life of its own. Claire noted that she thought Joe embodied authenticity, and this we come to this theme with this, um, with this student, with this alumni, sorry, um, that you stand by your work and passion, even if it's unpopular, even if everyone is fighting you. Joe is a strong female leader with grace, an important foundation for her as a female leader. She has been, Joe, an excellent um, role model. And the last of the 13, Megan Clem, um, who is at the Landmark Society of Western New York in Rochester. Uh, Megan has an interesting story, and this one I did not know at all. She didn't know about what preservation was, and she came to UNCG because it was on the list of grad programs in interiors and had a great conversation with Joe, and suddenly Megan found her way into the preservation track um, at UNCG. Um, she learned under Joe's watchful eye the idea of diagnosing buildings and problem solving in action. Megan believes that the field school distinguishes the UNCG program, coming back to that theme. She, like others, enjoyed visits to Joe's downtown home, opened up, she, showed, uh, she said, when Joe opened up and showed us her life in preservation and how she embodied her values in her everyday life. Um, she spoke with great fondness about their, uh, the impact of the New York City trip, the behind the scenes tour of Ellis Island and the Tenement Museum, particularly. Um, she called Joe an A-list celebrity in the preservation world, a major player to be respected. Megan stated there's no doubt that Joe has had an impact on her career, noting her care with people, a lasting mark on her that will last a lifetime. So to the idea of making marks. People said so many other things that I didn't have, I didn't have time on the 13 slides to get that all in, right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit poetic rendering with some great images. So I hope you'll enjoy those. If you haven't had an opportunity, there are many more images on the screen out in the lobby once we head that way. Um, but just to say some of the phrases that people have said, and then I've got a few things that came in by email in the last couple of days that I wanna share before I close. Tom's day, step-by-step, step, the idea of building step-by-step. Step. See what I did there, okay. Sorry, I had to do it. Um, yeah, yeah, clear. Uh, the notion of sharing information, here's that hidden dimension series that I mentioned earlier, marrying new technology to old ways sharing experiences, looking in every direction, contemplating the world, touching the past, galvanizing community, reveling in the moment, sharing stories, building foundations. See what I did there, Robert? <laughs> Always learning new things, bringing worlds together, facing the future, giving good counsel, celebrating life, remembering success, creating spaces for conversations, tackling all jobs, no job too large or too small, pausing in wonder, Finishing well, standing in the light. Glasses off again. Okay, so Joe, I, I did have some communications that were outside the norm bounds and got some interesting stories that I need to share. So this is more like the roast part, just so you know it's coming. From Tommy Lambeth, um, who did write me and he was sick this morning, so he wasn't able to be here tonight. So maybe he's watching online. Hi, Tommy, if you're there. Um, we all know how well organized Joe is. 
She's the queen of preservation guidelines, for heaven's sake. But her office? I remember walking by and seeing, oh, listen, there's other people that have been there. <laughs> I remember walking by and seeing her look up beyond the stacks of papers, books, reports, receipts, and all manner of stuff stacked on below, around, and above her desk, the bookshelves around her in a similar state. If I asked her about it, she would say she knew where everything was, but I'm not sure I believed her. <laughs> From Judith Cushman Hammer, and Judith's here tonight. Um, I think this is beautifully said, Judith. You always have such a great way with words. Forever calm in the face of whatever. Always smiling, always tactful, and very level-headed in tackling substantial issues. Let's see, from uh, Jill, who had knee surgery today, so she couldn't be here, and she's not even watching because she's under, under, sir, under uh, anesthesia. For me, words I think of for Jill, enthused, optimistic, thoughtful, bright, committed to goodies, to, sorry, committed to goods, good, oh my gosh, <laughs> maybe I'm under anesthesia, <laughs> to, committed to good and to friends and family, analytical, real blonde and blue, that great giggle, yummy brownies, spectacular kids, and she was the first person I ever knew to have a BMW. <laughs> okay. From Teresa Rasco. This one is great. Like this may be the t-shirt. The cheery cat herder. <laughs> it works, yeah. Um, Lisa Tolbert said, please, please say something about privies and mortar repointing, <laughs> which I think I got both of those in. Okay. Um, Peggy wrote you and said, in my retirement year, this is Peggy's words, Peggy Center, um, my theme has been honoring my teachers. Joe, you are chief among them for 50 years. You've been my professional inspiration throughout your amazing career and a guiding light in how to be a good friend. Lots of love and much fun to you in this next phase. Well said, Peggy. Just one more. Um, from Sarah Marion, and I saw Sarah tonight, so you can give her a hug when you think about this. When I think of Joe, the words that come to mind are warmth, caring, passion, and pioneering. Joe is someone who I really admire on both a personal and professional level and very much a role model for me. I remember being nervous on my first visit to UNCG since I was coming from a small school and wasn't really sure what the program would be like, but Joe made me feel immediately comfortable and gave me a sense that I belonged there. Joe has an incredible way of drawing people in and creating a sense of belonging. And that is something that has left an indelible mark on me. Thank you, Sarah. Joe, that's a wrap. On to the next chapter. Joe Ramsey Limonsall, folks. I told you she didn't like to be in the spotlight. So what I'm gonna do is, is let Joe and Jerry uh, go first out into the lobby space and get settled in a good spot. Don't overwhelm her with a big line. Some of you have hugged her already. There's food and drink out there. So grab that and there's nothing, the recipe that you don't learn at the Lima Sol residence, of course, is that good food and, and drink are wonderful ways for lots of conversations. So let's the conversations continue. Thanks so much for your attention tonight. And thanks to those of you that are online.